is it better? Um, is this better sound wise? Or? Oh, this is yeah. better now, yeah. Okay, good, excellent. So as we were saying, um, Gordon began with sort of a discussion of the apologetic tone that can come in often when we're reading Hedwig Conrad Martius, both on our Christian level, but I think we can extend that out to the fact that um, Conrad Martius is writing in a time where there is possibility, but not widespread acceptance of women within higher university academic contexts. There's still sexual bias, which she is dealing with. Um, and then she's also layering on top of that, being someone who is theologically interested within the Gottingen circle, which is not opposed to theology, I don't see, but is it definitely draws a distinction within its work. Uh, Husserl sees him himself as developing a new science and, and does make moves to disassociate that from a strictly theological vein. Um, so when we read her and she can sound recondite, uh, academic, sort of ephemeral, using these neologisms, I don't, I think we read that in terms of somebody who's probably had to defend herself and sound quite, qu quite smart to survive in her field. Um, I, th I don't think we should read too far away from the reality of her context in that way. So, yeah. Excellent. I, Andreas, did you have a, a response to that? And I hope you're doing well with your, uh, yeah. Um, cheers. No, um, thank you. I have nothing to add. I'm fine. I had a surgery some days ago, but I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, glad to hear it. Gesundheit, yeah. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, so welcome everybody. Um, Evan was just responding to Gordon's, um, how, how would you describe it, Gordon? You had, you had a comment about, um, you know, theology versus her more scientific. Yeah, well, yeah, just in a nutshell, I find it, uh, I don't, I mean, I trust that Jim Hart makes Conrad Martius easier than she would be on her own. Uh, because it was his dissertation and he was trying to explicate from German into English uh, some very complicated metaphysics. And uh, I struggle. I mean, it's really hard for me to follow what she's doing and the layering on of a lot of new vocabulary seems to make things more difficult, at least for me. And the last straw in a certain way is when I turned one of the pages of Hart's book and read him to say, well, look, all this has to be taken into the context, in the context of her theology. And I said, well, oh my goodness, that, the game's over. The truth is to be found in her theology and should be discussed in the terms of her theology and all this other stuff is kind of like uh, a kind of a baroque frosting on what her take is well let's realize take, of where the cake is her theology yeah i mean that that is a presupposition and in a way she's um she's true to the phenomenological um you know lack of presuppositions and performing a kind of epoche. Now, the epoche that she performs is kind of like the opposite epoche. Um, it's also called the, the hypothetical um, epoche. That's, that's one of the words that's used to describe this real ontological reduction. But, um, but you know, theology rests on like a deeper ground than the, the natural attitude and and like the the normative sciences that proliferate. Oh, can you can you stop? Can, can I ask you a question? I think. What do you mean by deeper? Well, I mean like a lot of the different ways that she describes things with like the aeonic world periphery or or these these categories here. You know, they go much deeper than um, any of our telescopes or microscopes can go. Um, you know, thought penetrates deeper than the sensible. And a lot of the practices of natural science um, is stuck in the, um, in the, in the human range of, of, of the understanding of the natural. But and, 
What and she and you think she goes beyond the human range? Yeah, I mean, she uses the word um, transphysicia, you know, transphysical potencies. Um, and then similarly, uh, like Anna Teresa Temenetska is another uh, phenomenologist uh, who comes later, a student of Roman in garden. And, um, you know, she uses the word um, transnatural. So these categories, um, and they distinguish these categories from metaphysical as well. But, um, you know, they're about establishing a place for natural science and, and just the, the natural attitude within a broader, or you could say deeper, or you could even say higher. Sometimes I think higher and deeper can both be used to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I, I think I see it a little bit differently and I see where Gordon's coming from. Um, uh, well, maybe I don't see it differently. I think maybe it could be stated more simply. And I think I, I think Gordon, I disagree with what you're saying for this reason. And you're at, you're noticing that she, that theology is a dimension of her thought, and that's clearly true. But um, on the other hand, I think she's addressing real philosophical questions that don't necessarily, whose answers do not necessarily eventuate in theology or even necessarily metaphysics. I think there are real questions we, I think we can ask, not only scientifically about what are the rules that physical entities obey in time, for example, but we can ask, I mean, this is very obvious and basic, what is time mm -hmm. in the first place? And what is time is not a scientific question. It's a fundamental question in terms of which science and everything. And I see her, or we can talk about a physical object is able to move, for example. And that raises the question, what do you mean by is able to? What is potential? So I guess that's how I would respond to what you're saying, kind of disagreeing. I don't think it all falls apart and we can't accept it if you can't accept her theology. I think she's starting by focusing on these very fundamental basic philosophical questions like what is time, what is potentiality, what is being, what is a thing, and starting from there and trying to understand those things. And as she, and I think she's doing it rigorously and uh, something's going on there. Now she may end up in a place that you can't go or you disagree with, but even so, I see, even if one can't follow her all the way, I still think there's a lot of value in what she's saying. That, that's, okay, that's, yeah. that's very helpful. Thank you very much. And I just want to be sure that I'm going to back away because I know that people want to talk. The, uh, so I'm, I'm hearing you to say, look, uh, uh, she can, her, her views, her, her metaphysical views can rise or fall, be you know, uh, justified, substantiated independently of her theological view. They um, don't depend, they're not, her, all her theological views are not, are not as it were, uh, already fixed as a result. Of her no, I, well, no, I see her as moving into a more spiritualistic view of the universe based on confronting real questions about the nature of being and the nature of time and the nature of consciousness. And yeah. I see her moving step by step in that direction. And so, uh, uh, and so it's not so much where, whether her philosophy rises or falls, I guess I would say, whether more, more is there value in the process of reflection and insight in that process, even though it is perhaps in a certain point one gets off the bus, I think she's thinking clearly and on the basis of genuine, what is genuinely there to be reflected upon, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. Um, I would like to suggest <laughs> Um, this morning, I read um, Jim's um, comments to that paper or that essay that I 
um, distributed about summarizing the, the um, section on passing time. And I think if we follow what I've done and his comments in particular, um, Gordon will not have any problems at all. Um, her theology doesn't show up until the very end. And most of the time is spent on very hard thinking about time, which anybody can pursue. Yeah, yeah that sounds good. Maybe I'll pull it up and we can we can look at it in parts because that also brings us to the section, to the text, because Bill did a great job, um, you know, quoting from the text. Sure. All right, so let me share it and, um, and we can talk about its parts. Um, as we're going in, if anyone has any more general comments, you know, feel free. Yeah, just uh, one thought that I kind of laid up there, and then I know David has a little comment on the side that maybe he'll voice, um, but is that um, just with this conversation between theology and philosophy, one thing that's been playing on the back of my head is the conception of being. Um, what is being? What is Conrad Martius's essential anthropology? Um, it becomes an interesting question when we see other people who are sort of swimming in, in these thoughts. Rahner comes to mind with his epistemological humility. Um, the idea that isn't somewhat intrinsic to theology that we can view ourselves as having a radical contingency, that we do not need to exist. Um, but God exists. God is necessary. And so what does it mean to be and to be radically contingent and to be experiencing time as a radically contingent being. I'm just very interested in seeing how that plays in, not necessarily uh, looking at, not, not, not looking at philosophy, but how does that modulate the philosophical conversation? Because I think that's a different starting point of the human being. Um, so I'm interested in diving into this. Yeah. yeah, and of course, you know, there's that section on her philosophical anthropology, um, what was it? Um, but so the contingency is more like the circumstances of, of human being and being in the world being in this sense. But then Jeremy mentioned um, starting from first principles or something like that, right? Like these questions, what is time? What is being and stuff like that, right? Um, that's maybe like the other way of proceeding um, and kind of like the, you, you said, like, what is her anthropology in terms of like, what is, what is being for her? Um, of course, ontology is like maybe um, another way of looking at it, which is more in the circumstances of necessities about these foundations. So she's really maybe um, her foundational moves like the Orbe Vegung and, and, and all these categories that come out of it, you know, um, as, the, as those like become more actualized, um, the very idea of like being as act, like what is that? That's, that's more in, um, in uh, foundations. So it's kind of like, you know, Heidegger proceeds to uh, a project of fundamental ontology in his way. Well, she's doing it um, already before Heidegger and developing developing it, um, you know, in parallel in, in her own way. So, I mean, you can kind of look at it in terms of like um, what she's doing is a fundamental ontology and then also developing out of that as the roots, all of her um, philosophical anthropology, all the sciences that she engages which, uh, with, which are many, you know, from this, this common foundation, um, which of course is beyond the scope of, it's beyond the discourse of science, right? It's, it's dealing with fundamental, it's philosophy. And it's philosophy in the sense of like Aristotle's metaphysics, which of course Aristotle in his metaphysics, set, he says that what he's doing in this science of being, qua being is um, theology. So of course that's ontology. So there's a kind of um, Aristotelian sense of a synonymous ontology theology, you know, dealing with these first principles. And it doesn't have to be personal theology if that's easier. That's how I approach it. Maybe, um, you know, it, it could be like the adoption of a, of a particular spiritual religious path. I think it perfectly applies, but you could also think of these as categories like the infinite or nothing and being, you know, and, and in that sense, it's kind of like more the, the Heideggerian um, style of philosophizing as fundamental ontology. That was something I wanted to say. So let me um, let me share the thing. Um, 
so I'll I'll read some, but maybe we can other people can can do some as well. Um, and Bill, it's it's your thing, so you know, <laughs> let's let's go into it. Okay, so so um, just to situate us, we um, we're in our reading group, and and we ha are just actually at the the cusp of chapter six. So we're actually like way in the end of the book here. Um, there's just a few chapters, and they're really short chapters at the end there. Um, and yes, th at that point, it gets very theological, and it becomes very much about hermeneutics and this idea of a real mythology in the style of real ontology. So this is all very exciting, you know, um, demythologization and all these things, um, you know, coming out of really time, the relationship between time and eternity, um, which is highly thematic. And of course, space is there just as much, you know, she develops space, Apiricia and Aeonisha um, realm in both senses, both have a spatial and a temporal aspect and probably should also be put together as these um, these space-time continua, these these higher or deeper dimensions, right? Um, so that's the the weird part of the book that we're in. But right now we're we're jumping back real quick, uh, sort of like Plato does in the middle of his discussion of the sciences, um, to to do a, a kind of double take to to take in this. Um, fundamental definition and description of, of just regular passing time, but also in terms of this kind of philosophy that we find in, um, you know, a bit in Aristotle, a bit in Kant, we find it in Conrad Martius, and, and we find it in um, Peter Manchester. So we, we started getting a little bit into, um, you know, the philosophical tradition and the roots of these things in our, in our reading. Um, but so in particular, we're, we're in the passing time. And by the way, that is section three, four of Hart's book. And I'm just going to open it up. It's um, page 71 is where it begins. But here we are. So um, Jim starts by saying he's, he's also going to weave in a little Louis Lavelle in um, subtle but dramatic ways. Um, and Jeremy, you're familiar with Lavelle as well, right? Mm -hmm. And in particular, um, you know, I know some of Lavelle is being translated. We have like the starts of translating a great deal of Lavelle out on the internet. Um, well, there's a guy in Australia named Robert Jones who's translated most of probably Lavelle's single most important book called De L'Acte or Of the Act. And Jim and I, are almost done translating a shorter book called La Présence Totale, The Total Presence, that there's this guy, Jeff Local. do you know him? He's yeah. Like, and he's got a series that may accept it. Boston it wasn't University. Notre Dame, but no, it's a series on phenomenology and theology, a, a book series. So that's where we are with that. Okay. But other than that, little has been not one other book. Yeah, very. His major works have not been translated. Yeah. All right. So there's this um, this quote from page seventy two. So again, our reading begins on page seventy one, and then um, there's this important quote. So let, let's all just kind of contemplatively meditate upon it by hearing it. Um, I'll I'll go ahead and read it. The transcendental imaginative intuitive time, the intentional having of time is grounded ontologically in the fact that presentness is at hand only in a most minimal moment. If the imaginative lengthening forwards and backwards were missing, we would have no temporal consciousness. The time, which is always vanishing, which is present in a scarcely notable now that is the time which has reality. Time in the not yet or in the already no longer can be possessed only imaginati imaginatively. Uh, real time, as we shall see, is incessantly stepping forth out of non-being into being only to slip back again into non-being. And Jim highlighted this, this one bold part that presentness is at hand only in a most minimal moment. And then he proceeds to talk about that. So, I mean, he says a lot here and, and we should 
point to parts of it. I wonder if anyone um, wants to take it from here. I have my reading all highlighted. I have my favorites, you know. Well, I'll, I'll say something, because um, I've um, highly annotated um, Jim's uh, comments, um, <clears throat> along with some of mine, actually. Um, and so the thing that really we have to get at here is this idea of, um, of, of presentness, um, <clears throat> which is um, which have two senses. Um, one of them is, um, is our, what, he, what um, Conrad Martius calls our transcendental, which is our imaginative presentness, which has to do with consciousness. Um, and Jim will repeatedly say something like, consciousness is, <laughs> I'm gonna paraphrase him, consciousness is nowing, um, is a presencing. Um, and so it's always in the now. And so that's that's a subjective part. But also there's this also presentness, which is somehow rather actual and which is independent of a constitutor. And so um, and so um, so that, that that's my first comment. Um, and that's a comment too. It's this comment that he makes in the middle of the paragraph. It is not time which contains consciousness but consciousness, which engenders the flow of time. And so um, we have to understand what that means because the flow of time is, of course, imaginative. And, um, and, um, it's, and so anyway, the, time, the, the flow of the consciousness engenders this imaginative thing called the flow of time. Um, but time, what does it mean to say time? There's not time which contains consciousness. That's going to be important. What do people think that means? Yeah, I, I like where you're going with that, Bill, because I was also thinking the, the categorical distinctions here. I, I was meditating on the word, use of the word presentness within the highlighted section um, and the interplay that has, because it, it feels that that term presentness implies a state of being, which is contradictory to the very statement that it lies within, because one cannot have a state of being within a minimal moment. It's those two things you cannot state, you cannot do static and infinitely vanishingly small moment. So I think that, yeah, engenders the flow of time. I think you're right there. Can I ask it's you a question about that? Can I ask you a question about that? So, because this is going to be important, I think, for some mm -hmm. other comments. So, your understanding of being is it must be enduring in some sense. I, I'm, I am not sure. I, I, this is an open question here. I just know that our, our language here is pressing on the edges of what can be communicated. We're using words that kind of get at what we're getting at here. Um, presentness engenders. Uh, you're right, this is tough stuff. Um, I think you're right to notice that consciousness is kind of a linking of the idea of the present moment into a sense of flow. I remember, what was it, last time we talked about the two grammatical constructions we're playing with here, the, the conception of, of, of the layering on of different states moment by moment by moment by moment, uh, which is looking at them within their atomistic individuality um, and then the conception of flow, which necessarily means not being able to do that sort of atomistic look um, and the interplay of those two conceptions. Uh, it seems consciousness goes with flow, um, but then our analysis works within presentness, within moments of time. It, it, it seems like we're dealing with two essences here. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and he says in the very next sentence, the flow is that of which I am aware. Mm. So um, we're aware of the flow. I think we can all agree we're aware of the flow. <laughs> um, that's, that's pretty um, fundamental to our understanding of time. Um, but the core of flow is the place of the present. And so <clears throat> I put big quotes around the word core. Yeah. What does he mean by the word core? And so what I'm going to suggest is it means by core some sort that somehow the flow is founded on this quote, quote unquote place of the present. What does everyone think about that? Well, I, I wonder if I could ask it this way because I think it comes up in Manchester's book 
Uh -huh. uh, and and it, I found it very helpful. Yeah. Uh, are we aware of a flow or are we aware of change in objects of perception? Uh, that is to say, there's somewhere in Manchester, I believe, uh, where he, he says that flow or motion is not another fact about what's available, what's given in perception. It's a construction after the fact of observing change. An object changes in one way or another, and then flow, and perhaps time itself, then is a construction based on the reality of change. Uh, so are, you, are you suggesting, um, Gordon, that we have no experience of the flow without perceptible change? Well, yeah, I mean, we don't have a, f there, there, except that I might be, well, I, 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 if you'll pardon a personal reference, I've just come off two days of experiencing vertigo, which is an illness that I'd never experienced before. You can try and to explain, it is, describe it to us, Gordon. Yeah, well, it is <laughs> as if in your next step, you may very well fall on your face. It, it, it arises biologically from a dislocation of the granules in your inner ear, which normally keep you balanced by referencing gravity. And if they go, what, whatever it is that they do when they go wrong, when they do, you, your, your kind of intuitive sense of where you are in space is radically disturbed and it's very scary because you can fall. And so can, I, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. So it almost sounds like what you're saying is that vertigo is the experience of not having a place of no change. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a reasonable thing to say about it. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so it's, um, and that comes as close to it. It's, it's almost only when things go wrong mm -hmm. that the the uh, what will happen next, that is, the move from the instant to the future, becomes problematic, because normally it's just taken for granted. I'm not going to fall over when I stand up. Uh, I mean, the, and I think there may very well be just a whole bunch of things that are almost always true. And it takes something pathological or at least very unusual, even say, as we learn from others being in space. I mean, when gravity, when gravity doesn't operate as it usually does, uh, that there's a sense of weirdness or unusualness or of, of unexpectedness. How I, I'm not sure what the best descriptions are. Uh, and they can be, they, or even being drunk or even being uh, under the influence of psychedelics or strong narcotics, or, uh, whatever it is, where consciousness goes, our ordinary consciousness goes on a holiday and is replaced by things that can be quite frightening or depending on context can be ecstatic, can, can lead to a sense of illumination and deeper understanding. Um, or, can, let me say something about that because I've thought yeah. about that is that what I think you're describing <clears throat> is, is um, I'll just use the word alien. It's such that um, what happens is that the future becomes open Normally, we and we already project the future, and I don't just mean the way um, Husserl means it. We project it further into I don't know what it is, an indeterminate future, and it's sort of like it's already there before we're there. But when we get into the alien, it's like the alien a a l i e n. It's it's such that it looks like it's there's an infinite possibilities, and that anything is possible because it feels almost infinite. And that's, that's um, disquieting, unsettling, or as you say, it could be ecstatic in some sense, if yeah. you can stand in it. Yeah, and, and in the case of vertigo, you, I mean, you know, when, I mean, if, you're, if you've been asleep and you wake up and you, you, you want to go to the bathroom, 
Oh, and you, <laughs> Don't do you, that, your, <laughs> you, you put your feet on the floor right. and you stand up and you realize you're not sure whether you're going to fall over or not. So you instantly throw your arms out to try to support yeah. yourself. Oh, yeah, I can see and that. That's very frightening. Well, it's you know? frightening being waking up in the middle of the night when everything's dark and unfamiliar anyway. Well, and I'm, I'm digging in here, listening to you guys. I'm thinking more and more about the fact that there is some categorical distinction. Um, because what Gordon, you seem to be saying, and I, I was thinking myself about working out and doing a plank. Um, if you ever want to feel the experience of time as a minimal moment of presentness, you know, do a wall squat for 30 seconds. You're going to feel every one of those minimal moments of presentness. Um, but, uh, but it seems to me that if we do identify something about our consciousness of time being a consciousness of change, thereby we can recognize that time exists in our consciousness only as it is embodied, um, whether it be working out or experiencing vertigo or taking psychedelic drugs, all of these things modulate our consciousness, our awareness of time, but yet that there are things that are static in our lives, whether that be the broaching on the infinite or I'm thinking about the very construction of a thought. Um, the moment that you have constructed an argument, it becomes a, a static thing in some way. A premise is a static moment. Um, it, 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 it is frozen. And so there seems to be an interplay here. There seems to be some distinction between what we do with time and what we experience with time in itself, um, if this is making sense. Can I just interject, and I don't want to mess up, the, mess with the, con the, the trajectory of the conversation, but something I've been thinking about listening to this is this contrast between linear time and, you know, cyclical time. And I feel like implicit in a lot of her writing, of course, if you ask me to point out someplace in the book, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do it, but I feel like I have absorbed over the course of the book that one of the things she's getting at is that it's more, you know, a conception of more um, cyclical time as opposed to linear time. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense, but I mean, we project the past and the future and part of the future is creates this planning, this efficacy of planning. And um, that's not to say that pre-modern people or peoples who, who thought or think cyclically don't plan for the future. I'm just saying, I just think it's a, there's a slight difference. So Sally, I, I mean, um, well, I, I'm, I'm gonna respond to that. We, um, I can see why you have this notion. I mean, after all, we've been looking at these circles for uh, weeks now, <laughs> and circles are of course cyclical in some sense. But um, usually um, cyclical time, like whether it's Hindu or um, pagan cyclical notions of time, um, primitive religions, um, these are long cycles. And, and, so, and so there's a sense um, from what um, Conrad Martius has given us is that she's talking about there's some sort of long calendar. Um, that we don't get to until in that section on history or something. Um, and so I could see how you might have a sense that she's that she's speaking like that. She, she oh, does use you know. the circle as a symbol of the flow of the aeonic time. And the reason, and, and I think she says that that is an inadequate symbol and it's trying to put into a picture what can't be put into a picture, but it's something about the idea that the potentialities that flow into the world and whose flowing is the foundation of the time that we're in, that those potentialities themselves um, are not past or future, that they don't come to be and pass away. And yet somehow they're moving and that motion is what founds the time that we experience and live in, um, but it's not a motion or a change that's within what we normally consider to be time. And 
she uses the circle as a symbol of that other kind of motion, which is not in time. I think that's part of what's going on there as well. I also think that there's something circular about Husserl's notion of time, because suppose when a new moment arises, and by talking about separate moments, that's an issue, but we almost have to. When a new moment arises, the immediately preceding moment is retained and a is retained. And then a new moment arises, quote unquote, after that. And then the, that moment is retained and the retention is retained. So in some sense, the past is still present and that incessant process of retention and so to speak of retention of retention is basically circular. It's that there's a kind of flow of time in which the past continually flows into the present as a retention of a retention of a retention. And so the very being of time is an incessant circular flowing, but that flowing itself is, is not in time either. I don't know if that's that kind of hermeneutic sense. too. I mean, am I incorrect? That's kind of hermeneutic, isn't it? Um, I, I'm not sure. You mean like the hermeneutical circle? Yes. I mean, I'm just thinking. I mean, if you look at like Eliada and Ricoeur, they're they're both talking. They're both using the hermeneutic circle in this in this kind of way, and the and the like mythical aspects of the the non mythical like you know what we're calling reality generally, um, or or nature and the and the natural world and the natural attitude that's appropriate to that world. Um, but Bill said that um, the aeonic or or the circular um, might just be this on the big end. Um, I just want to point out that, um, you know, when we're talking about aeonic space time, it, it might have a lot to do with these like world epochal like aeons, you know, it's modeled on the like, you know, before creation, after creation, or, or um, you know, after, after Christ, like th these like theological aeonic uh, world ages, but there's also um, the apyric space time and it has an apyric period or um duration as well and so there's there's a kind of sense in which time isn't just time and eternity in the sense of like real time um as as we're calling it and aeonic time there's also a pyric time and maybe there's other stuff too and there's a general motif that applies in um all of these cases and that's a kind of um if not explicit and thematic, an implicit circularity of just reflexivity or self-consciousness. Um, in Husserl, self-consciousness and time are the two aspects that present themselves of the same figure, for instance, in the Husserlian diagram of inner time consciousness. Um, that's for Husserl, and I, and I know that's like dense. We're not doing the inner time consciousness just now. Uh, we will if we proceed with Manchester um, after this. But there's a kind of double continuity is the term Manchester uses. Um, following Husserl, Husserl uses this term and double intentionality and a, a fundamental or essential two-dimensionality two to time. Um, and we're getting this in, in this reading as well. Time is a kind of like something that we're... Um, we have like an aperture or a time window or a frame or a phenomenological disclosure space um, appropriate to us humans. Like Manchester writes, the, you know, it doesn't matter how many shots of espresso I take, the hummingbird is still gonna move faster than my human eyes can see. So there's like a, a minimal, you know, maybe one tenth of a second um, frame that's open to me to perceive changes, minimal changes in sensible motion. But, um, you know, he proceeds in this way to find that there's a, a kind of reflexivity or circularity, um, you know, not just in a, in a metaphorical sense, but literally with regards to the structure of, of reflection, you know, there's a kind of circularity there as well. So it could yeah, be- Randy, you've touched on something, which is, and I just was reading the site this morning, she explicitly acknowledges Husserl's lectures on time consciousness and regards what she's doing as congruent with that and, uh, and building upon that. 
And that's one thing that makes this difficult because if I think a lot of what she's saying sort of depends upon uh, depends upon having some understanding of yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so Jeremy, who's who's live on the on the thing right now, um, I got Jim on the phone. So I'm just gonna tell Jim, Jim, if are you, do you want to come on? Yeah, but I don't know how I can get a reply. So let me just send you. I'll just send it. Yeah, I'll send it in email. I'll just send you the link so you can pop on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay cool. All right. Bye. <laughs> Sorry, I, was, I couldn't hit my mute button because I'm sharing the screen. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. while, we're waiting, while we're waiting for Jim, there is um, there is another comment I wanted to make about this passage, and he says right after the passage we just read, there is no past given, except for what we were just talking about this retention of a time of in Husserl in understanding of of the temporal, our subjective, transcendental, and adjective understanding of time, and so that that forced me to think about that. And, um, and so this is what I write. Does this mean that the present is the only given? How is the present given? Is it given like a tree or a stone? It seems not. Is the present given at all? But rather, is, the, is it the condition for givenness? In other words, there can be no given without the present. So that's a question I have. I don't know. Yeah, and I Leaping up, and we're not going that direction right now, but I, it's for the sake of posterity, I want to note, if we're bringing in Husserl, Husserl has this sort of attentiveness to constructing a new science and avoiding, well, at least psychologisms. Um, and I see in here, whether talking about espresso and hummingbirds or talking about what kind of givenness, uh, there may be, we may want to point out sensitivity to avoid a strictly neurological definition of, well, our givenness is based upon our capacity for perception within the, the chemical receptivity of our brains and, and the functional uh, capacity of our eyes to take in light at a certain uh, dynamic speed in time or, or in change, you know. Um, I think it's very, I think it would be very verdant ground perhaps not in this direct conversation, but to, to meditate on the interplay as Husserl does with psychologisms the, and, and you know, psychology and, and the eidetic for us to consider what is the relationship between time as experienced with bodies as an embodied phenomena, but yet not determined by or not summated by a sort of neurological or psychological analysis. If that makes sense. So you're yeah. asking, you're asking what embodied time is like. Well, I, I'm I'm countering an argument that we haven't presented and probably won't, but I think is in should be put in the water, which is well, time is just our ability the the ability for our bodies to perceive change at certain rates given our chemical mm -hmm. sort of divergence. So. You know, of course, you perceive time differently when you have three shots of espresso or working out or doing this because your chemicals are different in your body and that's what's happening. That would be a sort of reductionist mode that I see Husserl countering a similar vein of thought as he constructs his new science. So I'm, I'm just putting that argument out on the table. Yeah. Well, I don't think that our, that our experience of time, <clears throat> I was going to get back to this about what um, Gordon said. I don't think our experience of time is, is um, necessarily uh, associated with change. It may be associated with our the rate at which time seems to flow, but it's not associated with change. Um, I mean, a static, I mean, even um, Jim points to this and um, Conrad Martius talks about it. And, and, I, and, I, and maybe even Manchester does um, about how we still experience time passing without change. Um, in fact, I would say that what time is, is essentially what it means to be conscious. That's our experience of time. As long as we're conscious, we're experiencing time. <laughs> because consciousness is always nowing, to use my verb. So let me just welcome Jim. Hey, Jim, hey. we're talking about your book. Sorry <laughs> to be late. You're going um, to know that 
Uh, I just want to point out that um, a lot of the things that we're talking about, about both both different kinds of time and um, also like space and and also like consciousness, you know, is a lot of um, having frames of reference, you know, um, in terms of the like purely noetic structures um, behind a lot of what we're talking about and and the physical as well, you know, um, the physical world itself provides a kind of frame of reference. <laughs> You know, maybe a lot of what um, Conrad Martius is doing and starting from these foundations or from first principles or whatever, or or fundamental questions is um, trying to get at a, um, you know, the truth, which would be this ultimate reference system. And so thereby, you know, fall into the mode of speaking in terms of um, some, at least admitting some absolutes. So, um, Jim, we were just opening up. Well, we were going through the email. We were talking about um, using the the email, um, the um, the document, the conversation between you and Bill um, to to guide us. And um, we opened up the meeting with the question of like the theology, the the more like absolute mode of talking um, versus like natural science. Um, and and slowly we've we've been letting um, the more um, new kind of um, region of of being and essence that phenomenology opens uh creep in and and help you know explain um these kinds of differences between like the natural and the theological attitude or mode of explanation good so I don't in particular i, I, I could just share here's where we were looking maybe I, i'll just be quiet and let you continue i have I wanted to I wanted to share with you uh, some text that Conrad Marcia shares uh, early on in the, her book on 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 the site on time the late not the early twenty seven article but the the nineteen fifty four or three or whatever it is article a book because it after going through this with Bill and and and, and after a, a fifty year hiatus from Conrad Marcia, I. Uh, I had the same experience of, of Augustine uh, that when you uh, uh, ask me about time, I say, sure, I know what time is. But then when I start thinking about it, I realize I don't. And, uh, and but uh, Conrad Marx is uh, clearly is very uh, uh, not exactly dependent uh, on, on uh, in terms of a causal uh, an identical uh, effect of a of a exemplary cause of, uh, on Aristotle, but uh, if I if I if you have a, a patience, I, I wanted to read for about a minute a, a, a little bit of Aristotle to show. I mean, her her question here, which is certainly not the uh, uh, what his his question here is not theological. No one's ever accused him of of, of being a theologian. But the it's uh, yeah it's on uh, the the uh, text that I was referring to are uh, let's see um, right at the beginning of that section um, let's see I forget where now um, I don't want to take time to do this um, where she quotes Augustine and, and Aristotle and Plotinus. Uh, and it's it's quite remarkable. Um, and I don't want to. I, I'm, I, but I do have the text. That I, I'd have to translate this stuff while I'm speaking. Let me just, if I may, let me just read a few passages from Aristotle, which she she summarizes. Yeah. Uh, but I found it quite. It's it's in the Physics, and it's around. Uh, uh, let's see. Two. Where did I write it down here? Um, Oh boy, there we go. Yeah, it starts at about 218A in the physics. And uh, don't forget this is about 2,500 years ago. Hmm? And, uh, and, and there's parentheses, I was having a conversation with Bob Sokolowski, whom you, some of you know the other day. And he, we, I just, we, he was he just finished a, a course on, on metaphysics so it's Aristotle and, and, and uh, 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 Husserl, of course. And uh, I hope he gets this out, uh, published. Uh, he sounds great. But the, uh, 
but we had occasion to say that so much of the basic issues that still plague philosophers or, or, or charm philosophers or uh, render philosophers um, mystics are already in Aristotle. And, uh, and, and he referred to it as he's a kind of historical miracle. I mean, there's, there's something about, about Aristotle. I mean, I Plato too, of course, and you can list the, you know, all of your heroes, but, but Aristotle just seems to uh, be the, the a grandfather for most of them, at least my heroes. But here, let's just uh, look at this passage. Um, okay. So he said, yet time is made up of, of uh, things that seem divisible. Uh, and uh, because we're thinking about things that, that, uh, that change and so forth. Um, and he says, uh, if a divisible thing is to exist, it is necessary that when it exists, all or some of its parts must exist. But of time, some parts have been, while others have to be, and no part of it is, though it is divisible. For what is now is not a part. A part is a measure of the whole, which must be made up of parts. Time, on the other hand, is not held to be made up of, uh, it's not held to be made up of nows. Again, the now, which seems to bound the past and the future, does it always uh, does it always remain one and the same, or is it always other and other? It is hard to say. If it is always different and different, and if none of the parts in time which are other and other are simultaneous, unless the one contains and the other is contained, as the shorter time is contained by the lower, longer, and if the now, which is not, but formerly was, must have ceased to be at some time, the nows too cannot be simultaneous with one another, but the prior now must always have ceased to be. But the prior now cannot have ceased to be in itself since it then existed. Yet it cannot have ceased to be in another now. For we may lay it down that when one now, uh, lay it down that one now cannot be next to another any more than a point, and he means the geometric point, can be next to a point because it'd have to take that space if it were, and it would no longer be a point. If then it did not cease to be in the next now, but in another, it would exist simultaneously with the innumerable nows between the two, which is impossible. I'll, I'll bear with you just one more uh, 30 seconds. But yet neither is it possible for the now to remain always the same. No determinate visible thing has a single termination, whether it is continuously extended in one or in more than one dimension. But the now is a termination, and it is possible to cut off a determinate, a determinate time. Further, if coincidence in time, that is being neither prior nor posterior, means to be in one and at the same now, then if both what is before and what is after are in the same now, things which happened 10,000 years ago would be simultaneous with what has happened today. Nothing would be before or after anything else. As to what time is or what is its nature, uh, the traditional accounts give us little light. Okay, I, I, I just suggest then at, at the, the next section, uh, Conrad Marx's position starts to emerge, but I won't read that. But I exhort you to look at that uh, uh, discussion starting at the, in the physics at 218, just before 218A. Uh, I think you'll, you'll find a lot of what her problem is there in thinking about time. And, and she, of course, as we know, 
makes it a theological issue in her youth, and then she's dissatisfied with that. So I'll be quiet now. Thank you, Jim. So I have a question about that. I did. I wasn't able to follow all of it carefully. I, hard, I know that it's hard to hear me read, y'all. No, no, I'm just not fast enough. But um, I'm wondering if most of what she is confused about is this notion that we've talked about with space also, that it's infinitely divisible and yet it makes up a finite whole. This relationship between the infinitely small and the finite, is that where the primary, the crux of the paradox? Bill, I'm not sure I grasp it. Uh, the, I think what the, the gist of, of both Aristotle and Conrad Marx is, is, is that uh, it's only time, is, first of all, it's, if it's flowing, and we seem to have every reason to think it's flowing, hmm, we have trouble saying what it is that's flowing. We can't get a hold of it. Hmm. And, what, and what he, uh, when, when Aristotle comes up with this famous definition that it's the measure of motion with a before and after, we bring in, we bring in mind. Hmm. But she and Aristotle both are interested in saying that it is time is essentially not mind dependent. Hmm. Uh, that the, 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 uh, the, the there is, and that this opens up the door, of course, to a lot of meta, meta, uh, physical, uh, modern physical theory, you know, about time as, as uh, an integral, as well as ancient uh, physical theory, that, that, the, that the time, the peculiarity of time, whatever it is, hmm, is not a matter of there, the, we, we have to refer to the Big Bang, and we have to refer, which was obviously something that we're going, we can describe in the t uh, 21st century. Uh, but it's, it, there weren't any minds around to witness what happened then. Hmm? But we know that it, the Big Bang took time, hmm? it was a kind of motion. And there were befores and after, if there was an ideal observer there. Hmm? But the, but for her, as you know, that the, the, the before and after introduces time as mind dependent, and uh, and uh, Husserl uh, gives it an elegant uh, exposition, our experience of the flow of time, uh, and uh, uh, and she re refers to it briefly, uh, and many thinkers have missed what Husserl says is absolutely necessary, that the now what we can't. We only can refer to the now, we can't grasp it, if there is a, a penumbra of the now with a before and after, which is Aristotle's point. And for Husserl, this is a form of intentionality prior to memory and prior to expectation. That is to say, uh, we have a sense of experiencing the now simply because of the continuum, it, it slides off into the no longer, and it, 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 it uh, as we're, distends itself into the not yet. We have no experience of a now which doesn't lead into the not yet, but no experience of a now which doesn't hang on to just the now that just went before. That gives the now, a, a, uh, gives us a sense of the thickness of the now. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we have something to grasp. And yet, then we come into her kind of seemingly dialectical talk, but it's all in Aristotle that what we try to grab on this now is something that, that vanishes into what doesn't exist and this is moving into what doesn't exist. And its existence is not measurable, strictly speaking, by any, by any kind of measure. It's infinitely divisible if you want. And James, William James came up with the phrase, it's a specious presence. There, so he would say something like there it is. It isn't, there's nothing there, it's all absences. It's the it's the it's the in between of the presence, but the but the, the, what we have a better hold of clearly are the absences. We can remember, uh, call up and make present what just was, and we can um, uh, imagine in in a, not a a, a a Kantian sense, uh, and that's a distinction I, I wanted to make with Bill that the the uh, the, the, the notion of a transcendental imagination. 
if you have a, 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 Hus, a Husserlian kind of a, a, a imprint uh, is not the best term because imagination has to do with uh, 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 what is uh, not actually true, but uh, uh, possibly true. It's as if it were true. Hmm? It's, imagination always to, for, it has a sense of fictional to it, but the imagining of the future uh, it's not necessarily fictional. We have every, we have high, a whole physical science is based on probabilities. Hmm? Probabilities uh, of something, we get a strong, robust uh, physical law. If we can uh, 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 make very uh, tough and, and robust, the, the likelihood of being able to duplicate this experiment. But it's always a physical, it's always a, a, a probability. Hmm? And uh, so, but anyhow, the, the, we, so we do have, quote unquote, in a loose sense, an image of the not yet, when we presence the not yet, just as we, quote unquote, have an image of the no longer, but the, the, we, we don't have here strictly an imagination of, hmm, it's probably not, a, an image isn't a good word either here. Hmm. Uh, I'm sure Husserl has a lot to say about that. I just can't remember where and what. But the, 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 the image as something mediating, we, we seem to be directly in contact with the past in retentions. Hmm? And what a memory does is build upon that. Hmm? And we couldn't remember unless we had that lingering, uh, as he says, uh, comet's tale of the present, uh, uh, which he calls retention. And similarly, we couldn't really expect things unless we had this thickening of the present into the uh, uh, pro tension uh, is the word, his word of the not yet. But uh, we, we seem to think we have something called the present, but Aristotle and Aquinas and, uh, and uh, uh, Hedwig, Aquinas and Marxius uh, say, well, what do we have? We can't see that there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of an anomaly for a substance ontology, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the uh, and uh, Augustine and, and Plotinus, you know that they they are struck by the well, Plotinus is especially interesting for for uh, for uh, Cotton and Marxist too because he's he time and eternity are inseparable hmm? and and uh, but you know, if, uh, if we don't have a hold of time, how can we possibly have a hold of eternity? Well, that that's one of the fascinating things that Ravel introduces hmm? that we we. Uh, that we can't really think them apart from one another. But that's what her, that was her original position too. And the Ionic world periphery is a kind of eternity. Hmm? It's a kind of trans temporality, hmm? which is as, as with the theologian, the more theologically minded, eternity itself is a source of time and, and, and time is a kind of a revelation of eternity. So the, uh, for the, uh, for, but, but for Conan Marxius, because She's, I think she's charmed by uh, Heisenberg and, and, and Niels Bohr with the quantum phenomenon. Things seem to come into being out of nothing, you know, and, 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 and this is the basis of physics. And I think she wanted to make touch with that. And that cannot be a matter of, of uh, that cannot be a homologous with the traditional understanding of creation uh, for her. God would never get anything done. He's anything else done, so to speak, but constantly working at bringing about something uh, which immediately vanished into nothing, and they'd have to do it again, and they'd have to do it again. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, one thing I, could I insert a little bit, which is when you look at that passage in Aristotle, I don't think he really reaches a conclusion. He's saying time cannot always be different, and it cannot be always the same. And then Conrad Martius is also talking about this quantized present, which is not, and I think Martius, Conrad Martius and Husserl, I think they're, all of them are smack dab in the middle of an irresolvable paradox. Because on the one hand, it's totally impossible for a now to be or to be imagined or to be experienced that not it, that is not um, both part of a continuous flow of time, but also which is does not in the sense, but which is not also in, in, in part of a continuity in that there's always an anticipation and always a retention. 
And yet, if the now, and Husserl does talk about now points. Mm -hmm. He does not reject that idea. He uses the term now point. Mm -hmm. And he emphasizes that even though time has to be a continuity in a double sense, really, a double continuity, nevertheless, and isn't this obvious, that each quote unquote now contributes something new. Otherwise, there could be no change. There is such a thing as a primal othering or a primal emergence or a primal emergence of the different from the same. So the, the idea of a now point, even though it seems impossible, is also absolutely necessary. And how do you put these together? And I think that's why people keep beating their heads against the wall. And Aristotle saw this 2000 years ago um, because there's no way to really conceptually totally sort it out in a consistent way if we pay attention to time itself. And no, I don't, I, I don't necessarily see this having to be devolved down into paradox. What I do see is, is that, and, and as you were talking, Jim, I couldn't help but see there's an analogous dance step here to what is done in theology with God. Um, there is something core of the idea of, of an unknowable but infinitely necessary, uh, whatever you want to call it, that is mediated through an image or a logos, Christ in this case. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a theological framework at work in that, in that idea of time. And I don't know, it's a very curious thing. I could see, I don't know if it applies to Hustrow. I don't know, but I could definitely see Conrad Martius adopting a sort of theological framework in application to time of God. Well, she did in the uh, 27 you know, essay. Of the infinite present directly connecting us to the eternal, which is a absolutely vital conception of theosis deification to the very Christian framework of our relationship to a personal God. And you know, um, what Jim is talking about Lavelle, that's exactly what he's doing, what yeah. Louis Lavelle does, in, in a way that's very well, congruent both with Husserl and Conrad Martius. And I think you're right. But I still say paradox, because my question is, when we talk about God, when we talk about being, what kind of ideas are those? And they're ideas that we both understand and don't understand. And it's that sort of strange unity of understanding and not understanding. You know, it's like the cloud of unknowing. I think well, that's what I mean by paradox. Well, if I may, let me direct us to one of Jim's words here. There's a key. There is a key. I think this is um, because, uh, Evan, you said, would you say a dove step dance or whatever? I don't, I don't know what metaphor you use, but I'm yeah, there, there's like a, there's an analogous thing going on with um, what we're talking about in um, Aristotle and Conrad Martius. Well, you know, and fundamentally in, in Aristotle, who she's evoking, right? Um, and in, in the theology of um, the, the Christ logos that you're referring to, Evan, um, and, and, and Jeremy, you're bringing up the word paradox and indeed like there's so many different kinds of fundamental paradoxes. And, and I think um, a lot of times like when Husserl says paradox, like in the crisis, he's referring to these paradoxes of subjectivity or when Merleau-Ponty refers to all these paradoxes, he also brings them down to like a fundamental paradox of subjectivity or paradoxes of the world, paradoxes of transcendence, you know? Um, and then in, um, in like the theological mystical, um, where, where the theological mystical like touches logic and the, and the contemporary like formal logistic and mathematical analytic type sense, um, there's, there's, a, there's a, another foundation in um, things that are, you know, um, uh, paradoxical about expression, like propositional sentential logic, the dianoetic logic versus nous, the way that um, thought itself, um, the pure noetic, um, escapes the expression of it. Um, you know, th there's a, there's a, I don't know, would you say a dovetailing dancer or, or whatever? Um, you know, the same kind of move is happening um, as well. I think in the Urbevegum, in Spencer Brown's first distinction, and this key, I think, expresses um, 
the simple essence well it's not simple it looks it appears composite specifically the composite of the two um this is also like in the the platonisms that emphasize um the aoristos dias and in sokolowski i think also with the the presence absence dual duality he also emphasizes that this is a form of the aoristos dias or the, the twofold um that always accompanies the monad in in um, many interpretations of of plato and and the key here um in jim's words is that there's a double sense of this this now instant and present that he's been referring to um and he lays them out as a and b there's the flowing central ingredient of the flow so there's like the the flowing right and b um the the present presencing active consciousness which um and end of the i which transcends the flow so this is how jim's formulating the key right here there's this doubling right and in husserl um peter manchester points out there's um a fundamental key that he calls the um the uh double intentionality the the um what's the word he uses um uh double continuity he actually refers to the 1905 inner time consciousness um parallelogram as the um the figure of double continuity because it's this one capital f figure that can only be expressed under two aspects and therefore husserl gives us these two diagrams that correspond to these a and b of this key here there's a um a um a vectorial diagram like with arrows that um has a propagation rule it expresses a propagation rule and then the other one is a duration graph and another way of looking at these two is um the nunc stans and the nuke fluens you know if i'm getting my latin right right the, there's the the simultaneity of this paradoxical situation about the now that it's not a simple or it is a simple but it can only be expressed as composite the two nows or the the two limits of the of the interval, the spanned interval of the now. And so Peter Manchester, uh, this is apparent to me because Manchester's book ends up being all about this, connecting this stuff that we're talking about in aerosol with Husserl and um, talking about this, this phenomenological disclosure space of the now. And the now is the, the thematic explicit um, manifestation of this you know, space of manifestation but he also intended to um, extend this to all this stuff about time and eternity to to space, to space and to like the dimensionless space or whatever I don't know the, you know space and the infinite whatever the the corresponding you know analogy is there. But I mean I just find as well in in a, like the relation of being and non-being, um, same kind of dance. I wanna I wanna also note here as we talk about transcendence here and and. Andreas and I have been chatting a little bit on the side and text, which is good. A thing to point out, I think a keen observation here is as we draw a distinction of double continuity, it's important to recognize even within a realm of eidetic or a realm that we transcend the flow, we don't remove ourselves from a chain of causality. We don't, can, we don't leave a sense of things developing or growing or changing, however you want to say it. Uh, unless we are also leaving any conception of logic, proposition, judgment. Um, it, it, otherwise things would happen instantaneously at the same time or without regard to time or flow. It's impossible to imagine a realm, if we're playing with time here, where A plus B equals C, that construction does not work in an eidetic realm unless A is before B and A and B together form a synthesis that creates C those require causality, those require chain. And so we're not, we're not drifting away from that when we transcend. Maybe we're experiencing it in a different way, but, but that's, that's, a, that's a keen observation, I think. Anyway. One point uh, I can make maybe uh, with regard to what Randy was talking about, uh, I, I, I think you use, did you use the expression like the double intentionality, Randy? Uh, yeah. yeah. That, in, in the Husserl, in the diagrams uh, that Husserl, you know, very early constructed, uh, and, and I'm, 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 I have to ask you to, you know, help me see how, how that quite fits. But what, 
what the diagram has in mind, if you think of now A, now B, or now one, now two, now three, now four, et cetera. Hmm? Uh, there will be there will be a corresponding uh, as as we get along the, the level of the actual experience, which is the horizontal line. Uh, we will find that at each at at now one at uh, drops on that diagram a notch as we move on to the set now two. Hmm? And that is not now, that's no longer now, but it's what it, what it is, its identity is now, it was, pre, it was, it was, it is now one, which was followed by now two, or which, yeah, and, and which preceded now two. When we get to now three, now one is dropped down again. And, 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 and at three, now two has dropped down to where now, as it were, in proximity to now. It's, there we go, okay, and and what we have there is this is all of what the what the uh, what I think the excitement that most readers or people introduce for Husserl for the first time we aren't really actively doing anything. We retain, say, I don't know what we need an empirical psychologist for this, but let's say at now ten, uh, we have a retention of now one. Hmm? And now one as preceded by, by uh, uh, now uh, uh, now we had at, 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 at now ten we have now one but we have now one as followed by two through nine hmm? and and we have this as a as a, 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 a capacity to recall and when and when and when we recall. We recall now one in the horizon of what preceded now one for our artificial purposes, and what was followed by now now two, hmm? and and that that memory and that memory conjures that up. Now we get increasingly, as especially as you get to be my age, you get increasingly problems of access or when one when, when was that the past what he calls passive synthesis breaks down. But the, there's kind of a miraculous rationality here hmm, that pervades our our most spontaneous flow of life, hmm, where there's an ordered logos, an ordering logos, you know, and and this is a uh, a uh, 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 it, but this for Husserl is accounted for hmm, by a sense of. Of, of time, which is pre-objective and pre-thematic, and it's and it's in this case, this sense of time is being generated. And the the, the, the acute problem for me, and I I'm sure some of my my colleagues could straighten me out, but it seems that for Husserl, the I, which is the source of all the experiences. Hmm, Itself is it in time. Husserl insists that the I is lives the flow. Hmm? That's to say, its waking consciousness is, in one sense, immersed in the flow. But the, the I, as an I pull, as a transcendental observer, is not. And this is this is, this is something that Conrad Marx is box at. Hmm? She doesn't. She hadn't, didn't have access to the manuscripts and everything hmm, uh, on time concept, but Husserl seems to have a sense in which the transcendental eye is not in time. And well, if the, but it, then it if but it is self conscious and it is now. Hmm. And I think that gets closer to that text that that, uh, 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 that Randy pointed out the key there that the now the 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 uh, the act of presencing anything is now. Hmm. Even though there is a there is this this diagram of two intentionalities in play, there's still a non-flowing now in play in the apprehension of time. But that I as she says, the way she puts it, that that and she didn't know all about this stuff, but uh, it, that idealizes the world even more. Hmm? And she wants to, and she wants to say that 
that, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that can't be right. There has to be the objectivity of time she wants to say, uh, secure. However, the problem of the, of the, the, the kind of quasi eternity, the non temporality of the eye has to be accounted for. It's not God. Mm -hmm. So that means if you're going to, if we, if we need to, and she, she early on in 27, precisely, Evan, she, she argued your point in that early essay uh, of, the, of the, how the, the uh, experience of the discontinuity of the eye requires the divine creativity. Mm -hmm. She was concerned about what that meant about the whole process of creation. And, and I think she, did, she doesn't devote enough thought to it. I, 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 you know, I, I, who does ever devote enough thought to anything? But it seems to me that in, in, the, na in, the, in the effort to, to make an, uh, a strong sense of nature of Fusus is that which emerges out of itself by reason of its own potentiality, that God really creates a nature and the, reach, and the nature therefore has to be self-creating. That's the kind of argument she's using. The pro time process itself has to be due to nature, as and nature in its in its deepest underpinnings, which is sketched in the Ionic world periphery. Mm -hmm. But that uh, they're, 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 the issue of the eternity and time seems to be uh, uh, the correl correl correlative notion for this reading of Husserl which suggests that the, the transcendental ego is not in time. Well, if it's not in time and it's self-conscious and it's not a passing time, then, then it is not only immortal, it's, it, it's not really, it somehow participates in eternity. Mm -hmm. But the, that's, that, that's her problem is not that, because she thinks that it means it's a, she thinks of the eye as being somewhat just an observer of the empirical eye, but she doesn't address the issue. If there is such a thing as observer of the empirical eye, is it itself temporal? And she says it has to be basically, hmm? uh, because that, if, if, if it, and, and if, if it, and, and if it were true that it was a cause of the experience of time solely, then then the, uh, she, it would get into a bad idealism, hmm? and that she's opposed to. Time has to be have a real uh, tra uh, a foundation outside uh, any sense of ego for her. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly important differences and uh, maybe the, the possibility of reconciling Husserl's inner time consciousness concept. You know, I mean, they, they're based on the same kinds of foundations. It's just that he doesn't really um, go into that corner of the, um, you know, maybe the, the Anfang or um, the Erinerung as it proceeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Evan? Oh, it looked like you raised your hand, sorry. Well, I can just, another footnote to this. For Husserl, <clears throat> where God comes in, is when we need, when we seek to account for this ordering logos, which we find in passive synthesis, which, of which we can't, don't take responsibility, it's a necessary condition for all of our responsible acts. He says that it's the divine entelechy, which is, which is more imminent to the eye than anything and more transcendent to the world than anything. Mm. So there's a coincidence then of an egoic principle and of a uh, ideal principle, an ideal in the concept of a regulative idea. Mm. So the, the, yeah, the, the, there's, I, I think that the, the, and Aristotle is in the background here uh, in an amazing way. Uh, and I, I, when I read over that, uh, the physics passages that she alluded to, I was just struck, you know, how, how uh, on, the, on the money, so to speak, he was, you know, on, on raising the, the dilemma that she finds and leads her to a theological. Uh, well, I think the, the like first footnote in that book is just right there to um, Aristotle's physics, you know, um, 218b, um, the lectures on you know, time. And then um, I, I think maybe the next page or a page after that, the next footnote um, for a classical source that she brings in is um, Plotinus, um, uh, the section on time and eternity in the Enneads. Mm -hmm. um, so she's definitely building on, um, you know, the foundations, the 
of course. I mean, the definition of time is there in that section in Aristotle, and all the stakes are present, you know. Um, and and as Aristotelian ontology, ontological philosophy of, of time, and then and then Plotinus, you know, so who also is is bringing more thematically in um, Plato, who might be like dialectically present for Aristotle. So th that whole you know um, nexus of of thought is uh, where this is coming from, but also just the the reality of time, the nature of I mean, you know, we could bring in these ancient sources, but I think also she's just like doing what they were doing as well, which is divining the truth from, um, you know, careful, rigorous observation of, you know, nature and thought and, and just this, you know, our being through being. And if I could just throw another footnote, you're mentioning what she draws from Husserl. Now, she does explicitly refer on page 18 to the 1928 yeah. phenomenology of inner time consciousness. So she she is work, she knew oh, that, yeah. but of course she didn't know the C manuscripts Bernal. or the Bernal manuscripts. Yeah. And it's only there where Husserl starts talking yeah. about the eye as not being in time. Yeah. I don't think he says that in 1928. It doesn't sound good. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, another connection there, Randy, is that in those early pages, she refers to Augustine. She only refers to the the, the kind of paradoxical phrase uh, that uh, you know. When you ask me about time, I thought I knew what it was. But when I started thinking about it, I realized I don't know what it is. But the what Husserl took those texts as the most the best philosophical analysis of time and time consciousness uh, that we had up until his time. And uh, but. The, the, but what he does there, what Augustine does there, is precisely the Aristotelian and Conrad Marxius and uh, Evananian Underbrinkian. Uh, we we have a we have a, a theological issue for Augustine. The past doesn't exist. Hmm? The, 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 the now is inseparable from the, the, what the the, 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 the short term memory, uh, the retention, the equivalent, and the short term uh, anticipation, namely protension. But neither of them exists. Hmm? So the whole question of how something, how being is coming into being out of nothing, hmm? and then vanishing into nothing. That's the that's the that's pretty much the brunt of his analysis, or Augustine's. Hmm? And so this Zion's quanta, hmm? the being quanta, that Conan uh, 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 Marx is, as I say, she she did that very elegantly in 1927, and then. 25, 30 years later, she was. She felt that it just made a notion of providence and uh, the concretio continua uh, and so forth uh, uh, look crazy. God was never a creator. He was almost a creator. He was wanting to be a creator. He was striving to be a creator, but he never quite made it. And so, uh, I, you know, but it, 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 he, she raises obviously interesting questions. What it, you know, but I and. and uh, we can't imagine what that would mean in the life of God. There might be other ways of thinking about uh, uh, about the whole notion of creation, and she does it. You know, in, in creating, for example, the essence and intelligence, there is a kind of uh, at least a, 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 a metaphysical implication of what the essence and intelligence give birth to. And just as in Husserl, you have the uh, 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 in the, what he calls this uh, position-taking act. You you say I, I promise to do this, or I or I, I resolve to to uh, write this paper. You implicitly do all the things that are involved, and, and commit yourself to doing all the things that are involved without renewing the resolve. I'm just trying to make up a sense in which there could be a kind of act of creation, which would look like not creation merely at the beginning, but it would be ongoing as you're filling, fulfilling your vow or fulfilling your resolve. It would still be ongoing, but it wouldn't wouldn't be ongoing in the sense we had to be busy with every step with a new resolve. In other words, I think we could be we could, we could finesse the theological problem uh, uh, a little uh, better. And she doesn't spend much time on the on the on that at all. Say, um, I've been looking at the diagram 
Could I share the screen? Because I think I figured it out. And I want to check this with Jim, the circular diagram. You mind uh, if I do uh, that, Randy? Yeah, uh, why don't you try? You Are you able to share screen? Post disabled not... participant stream sharing. No, I oh. can't currently. Let me see if I can help you. Yeah, I think I can do it here. Um, OK. Now you should be able to. OK. Okay, and I want this one. Okay. Let's see. There we go. I don't, gosh, I don't see it. Your screen sharing. We see it. Oh, you can see it, but I can't. See anyway. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you can see this. Do you see my cursor? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so here's the diagram. I realized this is supposed to be a tube. It's oh, yeah. not two circles, it's a tube, yep. like an inner tube, yep. right? It's a tube. Yep. So the idea, and the, this, so this circle here is the world. And in the world, there's the temporal time, Zeit, we should cite, and this tube is moving around. Mm -hmm. And that is the so-called motion of the aeonic world periphery. In other words, of the potentialities somehow flowing into the temporal time and constituting the temporal time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and so I here's another picture. Well, no, let me go to this one. Um, so here's an actual. This is an actual tube. This is a light bulb I found. And so the the, the, the so the the ionic world periphery is like a tube, and it's moving again. It's moving. And that's the motion, this, in some sense, it's the motion of potential, of, of potentialities, even though it is not a motion in time. And um, I don't know, that just, and, and then she also talks about the relationship between the world periphery and the world center. And the world periphery has to do with the potentials and natures that flow into world time but they depend upon the different kind of potentiality, a material or a material potentiality or a passive potentiality of the world center. And so somehow these two are essentially related, but, uh, but she's not that clear, but I'm a little confused about that. Now this is, now just, she... this is just the, the re residue of, of the Aristotelian hule prima, of materia prima. The prime right. matter, mm. okay. and, and yeah. there's stuff. It's stuff because all the all the other things are form. Mm. All the other things are forms, but because we're talking about physicality of the nature, she needs this principle of the of the of the uh, of materia prima. And I think what she kind of says about it is: suppose we just had all of these potentials, what holds them together into one world? Mm -hmm. And so you need some sort of principle that unifies the world such that all the potentials belong together in one world and that each moment is the moment of the same world. It's not just like lightning striking here and there and everywhere, but, and she uses that image of lightning. Yeah. So is the movement of world time this is one thing that I was a little confused about. What do these arrows mean? Now this arrow here means the motion of the whole tube going around and around. Mm -hmm. But then what is the motion? What is this motion number two of real time? Is this just in a superficial level is the idea that this circle is also moving around this way? Or what does this really refer to right here? I think she wants to link, you know, what's going on here by making that a, one consideration myself. But the point, of course, is this is the actual now. Hmm? But what is the actual now? Because this is a two, I, this point, and this is the world. Yeah. So she's not referring to this point here. She's no. referring to, yeah. I'm not quite sure what the actual now points to, this whole circle? The, the, the actual now points to the concentration of the the ionic world periphery at this point. And as it keeps moving, it's at this point, and this point, and this point. And, this and so, point. The, so the point is represented by this whole circle. 
or right, which at, is, the, right at the which top. Which is inscribed there. in the, in, which, which is a, a cross section of this circular tube. I think so, yeah. It's just wherever there, where, this point of contact, it's tangential. And, and it's a chapter where early on in the book, there's an Aristotelian version of this, or Aristotle's right. version. And that's, I've got that here. No. And the way, he, this is how I kind of figure that out. He, no. what, what she, I think what she's doing is taking the Aristotelian version, but adding a new dim the dimension of time. No. So this is, a, in a sense, a four-dimensional no. version of the Aristotelian version. And no. for Aristotle, the tube, and, and I was, I've read most of Die Zeit by this point, and when she talks about the outermost sphere, which is either the prime mobile or the, uh, or, or the sphere of the fixed stars, mm -hmm. she talks about when she looks deeply into Aristotle, she says, I think, that this is the time of the motion of the fixed stars is a different kind of time from the worldly time, the sublunar worldly time. Yes, yes that's and right. And so, and so we shouldn't see it just as another part of the physical universe, yeah. and that somehow the origin of the worldly time, or the sublunary time, or the, or the other spheres, the origin of that time is this somehow fundamentally different uh, uh, time of, of, of the prime mobile or the fixed stars or of, of the outermost sphere. Oh. And that for her, that sort of She's saying that when Aristotle got rid of Plato's demiurge, he still needed some sort of intermediary between the unmoved mover and the world we live in. And the outermost sphere plays the role of that intermediary. Oh, no. And so I think what she, she made more sense to me because I realized that I think Conrad Martius was sort of inspired by this idea of the outermost sphere with this paradoxical, strange, hard to define sort of being in between eternity and time, a kind of intermediary. And she uses, that inspired her idea of the ionic world periphery. It's not exactly the same as Aristotle's saying, but there's an analogy. Oh. And so according to the way she displays Aristotle, the tube is the outermost sphere, and um, the disk is the earth. And so the motion of the sphere, um, let's see, this, let's see, outer, the tube is rotating. Oh yeah, but the surface of the tube is also rotating. Mm -hmm. And so there's a rotation like this, in addition to a rotation like this, and the rotation like this is the physical motion of the tube, but then the temporal motion is extended into time is the tube moving this way so that in the physical motion, the stars are points, but the stars are lines on the tube. Cool. Uh, maybe I've lost everyone by now, but... Um, but she, so this is just one thing I kind of figured out. This is so awesome, Jeremy. Really? <laughs> that this is, you know, I tried to dig back where she describes, um, where she describes Aristotle's uh, spheres and then how she analogously uses that for her own system. Can I just add two, two, two footnotes here? Um, one is that the, uh, um, the, the, as helpful as the diagram is, we must remember that this is not in space. Right. And don't forget, space is a term where she, she's pretty well dismantled Newtonian space hmm, as a container for everybody. Hmm. Space is what, is what beings make in order to exist. Uh, it's they, they, and, and there's no pre-container space. Space is the, is the creation of the conditions for the development and the prospering and the flourishing of bodies or, or, or yeah, body spirits or whatever, spirit bodies. Mm -hmm. So that, when you interject that, then there's a, there's a shift, a gestalt switch, I hope, that this is a picture 
which essentially is a distortion because we're forced with a, a very Euclidean ge geometric picture or a Newtonian picture mm -hmm. even or an Aristotelian picture because the outer spheres were up there off, you know, outside of us. Right. The other yeah, point- Yeah, that's the core thing I got. She talks about for Aristotle, it's ambiguous. Is the outer sphere in space and time or not? Yeah. And she's saying he was, he was on the right track, but mm -hmm. what he's really talking about and what she wants to talk about is not in space or time at all. No, no. And yet it's not simply eternity. It's somehow the intermediary between time and space and eternity. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. The other point is that uh, what bothers me is, is you mentioned the demiurge. Hmm? And I think that the, the uh, uh, it's very much like a demiurge because it seems to be almost uh, have, have, have mind properties, um, M-I-N-D, hmm? in the sense that there's such an elaborate planning or elaborate sequencing and elaborate arrangement, a, 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 a logos that is seems self-referential. And where it strikes me most, if you if you were to read her little book, Die Geistseele des Menschen, uh, which is a, a little book about the, uh, the, the human spirit uh, uh, and, and, and it's coming to be and, and, and uh, the whole, uh, what she regards as a silly almost, the uh, uh, modern uh, 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 fascination with individuality and uniqueness in terms of uh, uh, the person. She, she offers a debunking of that. And because she has to, the human, the human being, now say for example, uh, uh, the Catholic church uh, uh, holds a, a, a remarkable ontological kinship between the uh, uh, the creator and and any any born spirit. Hmm? There's a kind of immediate creation of the spirit. Hmm? That's the whole problem for me. But not keeping that in mind, the whole problem of of how it could be uh, conception could be you know uh, already a human person. But in any case, with the with at, 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 for Aquinas, it didn't come with conception. It came later. Hmm? But the point is that that moment of, of the creation of the human person, the human consciousness there in its unique, and it's, the scriptures are full of this theme. I, 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 Ephesians again, one, four, I chose you before the foundation of the world. Hmm? So there's a unique uniqueness to our individuation does not come to the individuating properties of space and time and genes and, and sociology and psychology. Hmm? There's, a, there's a unique uniqueness. I wrote 1200 pages on this, but, the, the, the uh, point here is, is that the, she has the unique soul person for, uh, distinguishing form of consciousness generated out of this non-intelligent, hmm, in, in the sense of conscious intelligence, uh, 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 intelligy. And, 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 each, and there's a special in, uh, kind of intelligy for the human person. And it just, you know, is generated on the scene out of the in inherent wisdom and the inherent logos of the Anic world periphery. And I wrote a paper on that, criticizing that view of hers. Mm -hmm. But it, it still bothers me mm -hmm. that that this, this this generation of the person is a merely natural event, uh, because I think uh, there, there's and in her own writing, she has the. She has a, a robust notion of spirit, and it doesn't seem to me con to be continuous with the rest of nature. Hmm? But she radicalizes. She's she, she's uh, you know, and in theological naturalist in this sense. Hmm? So I think that uh, I, I think that I that, that did we pass that paper around, Randy, on the uh, archaeology of the of the self? Yeah, let me do that again. But anyhow, I, 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 that, that, that's still a concern of mine. That, that, that there's a there's a kind of um, a re, a, 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 a return of a Plato here is uh, Timaeus with the with the Ionic world for free. It looks very much to me like a demiurge, because it's got to do a lot of th thoughtful things, but it isn't thoughtful. There's no consciousness there, strictly speaking. It's intelligence, world, you know, world generating natural potencies, but the person is generated in its uniqueness and its distinctness. 
So I think that's a theological problem as a, as a metaphysical one. Can, can I um, add something that you guys are making me think? It's your fault. Um, and that is that um, I see a lot of overlap with um, this ionic sphere and this discussion about, mm, okay, well, I'll just keep going. So it seems to me now uh, um, analogous to the mind-body problem. It seems analogous to, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this idea that it's the angels that are moving the planets about um, that was common in the Middle Ages and um, Descartes' rejection of that, or I'm not sure exactly, but, but the problem is this. It has to do with that uh, a Jungian concept is that causes must be likened unto the effect. And um, what we have here in the ionic sphere, it seem, we seem to have two dimensions. And the problem is to understand how one influences the other. Um, I, I, I think this is, these are conceptual problems um, that um, seem to me only be resolved by saying that, that, um, that it's the same kind of problem we have in the um, um, matter and form issue is that you can ask the question, how does the form inform the matter? And as I understand the way that's solved is to say that, well, they're really nothing until they come together. There it's a synthesis that you can, you can try to break them apart logically, but really they're a unity. And so the, and does that mean anything I'm saying making sense? Because it's just this whole idea of, of um, we talk and we think about, we, we try to divide things, spirit and matter or anything like that. And we have the same kind of problem with physics, with we have law, we have laws and we have matter. How do laws inform matter? It's a, it's a similar problem. There's, there's this dualism that we can't get together. Um, does any of this make any sense what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, here's my view that, that um, you know, matter, whatever dualism you, invent for like purposes of understanding even things that are um, immediately right. present like the material the concrete material substantiality of things you know there's going to be um, some corresponding other thing like the subjective dimension or matter and spirit or um, or whatever you know and and we have to entertain that kind of distinction in order in order to hold open um, the the actual existence you know, and, and, and actuality and possibility is another one of these, you know, and I think um, we see this especially clearly um, in the case of space, so clearly that we overlook it, space is some like framework that's held open. Um, and in time, we have to like go to Aristotle and Husserl to see that time is like a, a window through which we are observing motion and, and you know, temporal phenomena. Um, and I think that the the like matter spirit um, dualism or any kind of twofold thing, you know, is is going to be um, something that is just necessary for for being in the world. I, I can't remember where I was going with this, but oh well, we need a frame of reference. I feel like that's like a a, a kind of general um, neutral term for a lot of what we're talking about here today, whether it's in theology or science or, or transcendental phenomenology or the definition of time, or even in experience when we like refer to everyday objects or whatever, you know, um, a frame of reference, somewhere to stick um, the thing in a way that makes sense and makes a cause makes the the heavenly, you know, booming, bustling confusion intelligible, turns the Uranos into a cosmos, you know, imposes some kind of order where we can be participating in an intelligibility. Otherwise, it's just like total chaos, right? Um, to, to use the, to bring up William James's famous way of putting it again, the booming, bustling confusion. And, and so we need a frame of reference. And when you have like um, things as actualities, actualizations of something that is of like potential, you know, sub potential, super potential, whatever, they, those potentials also need to be placed somewhere in some kind of intelligible field, some kind of frame of reference, a big picture. I think, Jeremy, you were referring to like um, the world, right? But in a bigger sense, when you were um, describing the diagram um, in, in the really cool PDF 
that that you made and um i hope we can we can all um get a copy too that that's so cool i love thinking with that you know i, I feel like we're really starting to understand something really far out you know but i mean i i call it the big picture just to give it a really intuitive simple um anna Teresa timonetska had this term in the 90s when um people were starting to like there was a proliferation of gps devices and in, in cars you know um and this is before the iphone had its its gps in everyone's pocket um a geocosmic transcendental positioning system was her term for this this kind of thing um uh, David's going to the um, Duquesne archives soon to go find this, um, among other things, um, a, um, a dialogue between um, Conrad Martius, I'm sorry, between um, Anna Teresa Timonetska and Eberhard Ave Lallemont, where, where um, Eberhard tells her about Conrad Martius or something like that. Timonetska does refer to Conrad Martius at times. Um, it's hard to tell, like, how much is um, she's like totally inspired by and has the genesis of some of her concepts in a figure like Conrad Martius, or how much is just, you know, they're blossoming in parallel because, you know, they're going on the same kind of sources like with Manchester. But I mean, how, you know, however people are arriving at an intelligible framework, a logos, you know. Um, it's cool to use this metaphor of like GPS or or just simply like the big picture, you know, like a big framework where the the potencies, all different kinds of intellectual potencies, not just for the actualization of material substances, you know, um, but but also like emotional and spirit, the higher like spiritual potencies, um, actualities that that we possess. You know, we we have intelligence, we have um, uh, emotions, you know, and 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 you know, so, so anyway, I, mean, I just call it the big picture, and um, okay, so let me just, let me um, because we're running out of time, I want to reference almost the same exact something saying exactly what you're saying, and it's from the poem that Jim cites from the Four Quartets, and he and he says this um, line, um, that quoting um, Eliot, he says, um, except for the still point, there would be no dance. Um, it's really, I mean, it's worth pondering that poem uh, because I, I'm aggrieved that, that Jim puts it in there. Of course, Conrad Martius does too. Um, to understand what exactly is, is going on there and whether it's true or not, and whether that's this big point, this big reference point you're talking about. And then the question I have is this still point is this an ontological still point or an epistemological still point? Um, that's my question, but it, but it, but it's that it's that very profound thing that that Jim and uh, and um, points to in Eliot's poem. Jim, well, I think the uh, 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 what's Before I start there, uh, I was just thinking about as as I'm preoccupied with the climate crisis, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the diagram uh, and you know the interaction because i build i think raised the question of the interaction hmm? but the interaction on not only of, of what we physicality of consciousness and and uh, bodiliness on spirit and so forth and so on but also uh, but in, in the particular case of of if if we destroyed the earth would there be any would would the ionic world periphery be in any way uh, disordered, you know. Uh, is, is, is there kind of reciprocity of causality there in any way? Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, uh, but to go to the still point of, I think she took that to be what what the, what uh, 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 who's the fellow who's over there? He's gone. <laughs> uh, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the uh, Evan is it? But that's early Conrad Marx's position, which is Lavelle's position too. Uh, she took that as the uh, uh, the way uh, she took eternity to to be what Lavelle calls the abs the perpetual uh, pending, perpetual pending, and and creation is this is this is this emanation of eternity into time, or this. This 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 uh, ex, ex, uh, this uh, 
because and 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 she too i think would say we should stop thinking of the uh, utter disconnect between time as we know uh, the, the, the flow of time and eternity because the now throws a, a wrench in all that hmm? uh and and so the, the now is as uh, uh, as uh, uh kierkegaard said is an atom of eternity and that was uh, a metaphor that uh, Lavelle liked, and the uh, so Bill, I think that. But on the other hand, my Husserlian side wants to say there's something analogous, uh, and so, maybe some way with the, the the you know the Roman Catholic theology of personhood, that there is a kind of of, of immediacy, immediacy of the relationship of eternity to temporality in the presence of a human person. And that that showed out in a Husserlian perspective, if I could read, push him in that direction, that the transcendental I is not in time. So there's a, there's, there's, a, there's an, 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 what is it? That is it eternal? Well, obviously not, whoever, you know, but, but there is a, there's something odd about being a spirit if your categories primarily are those of anthropology or natural physics or of physics or chemistry. Mm. And those passages in the uh, uh, in the uh, Bernauer and the C manuscripts and, and some other places uh, suggest, you know, and the, they don't seem to be sufficiently uh, uh, fascinating. They don't. They're not as fascinating to to uh, to uh, many Husserlians as they are to Jeremy and me. Yeah, I I wonder if uh, thank you, Jim, for for all that. I'm I'm wondering if I could return them to something that we started with. Uh, where, from where comes the confidence in our rationality? Whatever, why do we think that we are special in the world? Because I, I think I heard she say, it's, well, we're special in the world and now we have to account for that. And that's why we do metaphysics. But what if we're not special in the world? Uh, and how would we ever have a criterion of decision for that question? No. I have an answer for that. I, I, my, my answer for that is, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name now. Um, anyway, it's something I learned a long time ago in the critique of realism. Um, and it's, it's actually what we're talking about. In order to have a, be able to answer your question, you have to get outside rationality. And so the very critique of realism is you can't get outside the real world. And so there isn't, that, that, that's, um, what's his name? I can't remember his name, famous philosopher. Anyway, that was his critique of, uh, of, of having a non-critical realism. In other words, we're always on the inside. Um, we, we have no choice. We keep looking, and that's what we're talking about, the still point. The still point is a place outside of whatever it is we're talking about. Some place, some, uh, what Randy said, some um, reference place, some place, even whatever we talk about, um, whether it's time or space, there's always something outside of it that we somehow can look back on it. And that's what you're asking for, is some place to be where you can look back on it. And the interesting thing about phenomenology is that we are apparently capable of doing that in some fashion, because we sense ourselves as being in time. In order to do that, we have to, in some sense, be outside of time, just as we sense ourselves as being in space. In order to do that, we have to be, have some sense of ourselves being outside of space. Um, how we do that is another question. Yeah, I, I guess I, I hear you. Uh, I, I, I guess I think that it's possible that all of that is uh, kids playing with a new toy and, and what the toy is is language. And we, uh, we, give, uh, we give our skill with nouns far too much credit as if because we can say the noun, uh, we have confidence that it's pointing to something that matters. 
I think the answer to that is you're making assertions using sentences right now, and that's how you know. That's how we know that it's not true that we're not special because, <laughs> because we can even consider the question and even consider making an assertion about it. Well, the very I fact that we can make assertions is the fundamental inescapable foundation. But this is what this guy, Shiaka, Michaela Shiaka says, a very explicit argument on that basis for the existence of God. I think that's the answer, that you're, well, what you're doing is self-refuting because you're you. making assertions. Gonna... Okay, but then let me, may I, may I ask you this? If that's true, how does one distinguish among assertions? What, I mean, if every assertion is self-validating, then it would seem that contradiction, uh, just contradiction left the room. Uh, right, that's the problem of error. We can be wrong, but how? that's right. Uh, but on the other hand, right, and I don't know the answer, but I guess the argument is we are in a position where being right or wrong is at issue. And that can't be at issue. And that's the foundation. Okay, uh, but we but we haven't established the method for resolving which of these. Apparently, I'm hearing you say every assertion is justifiable, and uh, so, but I, I I'm not saying that all assertions are correct. I'm saying some are right and some are wrong, and so it's hard to know which are correct. But what is not in dispute is that the truth and falsity of assertions is at issue. That is not disputable. And that doesn't give us a criterion for resolving truth and falsity, but it does it is the foundation for arguing that, like you're saying, we are special. We're not just part of nature. We are different from animals. Yeah, I, I don't see that fall. I, I honestly don't. I, were, well, I was I with you that. up to that. I was with you up to that last, therefore. Namely, that shows why we are special. I didn't, I didn't get that at all. Doesn't it show that we're special that you can bracket yourself and think that way? I mean, animals don't think like, the animals don't say to themselves, I mean, I don't know, but I mean, animals don't say to themselves, uh, I'm not special. Well, and uh, yes, and? I'm just saying, isn't it a form of... Um, a kind of a bracketing for you to step back and say, um, we're not special. But then, you know, it's easy to get out of that, that frame of mind and proceed with your specialness. Okay. And of course, the problem is that doesn't tell you, oh, is Conrad Marcus right? Is Kant right? Is Shankara right? Is, you know, right. Who knows? That's right. It's, Right, it doesn't, that's, that's obviously a problem. Okay. But to, to say be... that, but God, how to put it? There's something, I think there is something fundamental that is universal, that can't be avoided, that has to do with, well, how do you name it? But it has to do with the very fact that truth is at issue for us. And that is not itself something that can even be doubted or be at issue. Well. Well, it would be true that that would be correct if we were sure that we were of one mind about what we had in mind when we used the word truth. I, I, I believe that statement you just made is false. I don't think we have to, I think we can know things with, without having to find them. I think we can. Um, so just to be clear about one terminological point when when Jim is saying unique self you know special in this sense I think is more um, of like I think it does apply when we think about like the human species as being rational and special relative to other you know in the natural anthropological sense but um, I think Jim right isn't it more of an ontological matter about like the inimitable nature of being um, like a being amongst um, maybe like, like, you know, it's a me ontology that, that you're articulating. So it's, it's really like about um, the, the striking distinctiveness, not just the determinateness, but the, the unique 
inimitability of of being the the specialness of of like uh, what manifests of of presence um in the context of like of non-being or me on i think that's more the general sense of um the word unique the unique self in those works am i am i off or well, it's uh, it's a long story, and, uh, <laughs> and and I would just give uh, uh, with Gordon, and I, I didn't ask find out from Gordon how how much he enjoyed his trip to Ireland. I got a nice note from him, but I want to hear about that eventually. But not to switch the subject, but the uh, uh, I I I I just assume not launch into that right now. But does it mean special in the sense that one has merited? Uh, some sort of recognition or privileges. Uh, uh, going back to what Jeremy said, I think the whole issue of truth is pressing and character in the, in the, in the uh, imperative towards truth. Uh, is, uh, and I think we can clearly make that distinction in ourselves when, when, we, when we are, say, telling lies or when we have been in, uh, sloppy in our thinking or when we have... Uh, uh, deliberately misunderstood someone and we've had or we want pushed our own opinion rather than listen to the, I think these are there are in the the uh, inseparability of the human consciousness from uh, its uh, from itself in terms of its being authentically authentically truthful is a feature one sense of being uh, human it doesn't however uh, mean that uh, there's a sense in which I may take liberties or be indifferent to my dog or the, the, the uh, uh, Amazon rainforest or, or the, the studies of, of, of uh, natural science about the beauties of nature uh, that I may wantonly behave towards it. Uh, the, the metaphor that people have been using recently is that we are stewards hmm? and we're stewards and responsible for our surroundings in a way we don't expect, for example, my great wonderful dog Ellie to be. As wonderful as she is, she really doesn't take responsibility. Hmm? And, and if she wants something, she wants it now and there's no contextualizing of the need. Hmm? So, and I don't mean to say that that's bad, I'm just saying that there are differences. And so I think, the, I think a proper understanding of what a, of a, a proper self knowledge of any human being comes with enormous the, um, obligation of humility and an, an enormous overwhelming responsibility for one's agency. And when one sees the damage of which we as a, a collective unit are capable right now, vis a vis nature, you know, we have, we have radical atonement to make. Otherwise, we're going to kill ourselves, not only disfigure nature. And be ungrateful for nature, but we're also going to we're going to suffer uh, 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 evils which are ne plus ultra. Uh, so I uh, I think Gordon, I, I understand the language about being special leads closely into arrogance and a form of uh, hubris, uh, which is ignorant and blind. Uh, but I think the the whole notion of the everything is in some sense an image of God. Everything wouldn't be anything unless it were somehow derived from God. But the special feature of the Imago Dei of, of the human being cannot be overlooked because we, if we're going to get out, for example, of our climate crisis, we're not going to look to, to squirrels and jay, blue jays and, and, uh, and uh, moths and so forth to get us out of it. And we know that there are natural pestilences and natural uh, disorders. And so if, if we're going to get out of it, it has to be through humility, and responsibility. And in that sense, we have special obligations, which none of creation has, but it's rooted in the unique form of human consciousness as it's tied to truth. Husserl has this wonderful summary of all of the logical investigation, a theory which makes theory impossible is not a good theory. And a theory here means, you know, a proposal of something as true and a proposal of, of, of uh, and the theory that, uh, uh, we cannot uh, uh, have true theories, can't be a good theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he has, and the other a, a link here, Gordon, with what, when you asked initially, how do we, how do we go about knowing that, that we, what do we, what's accompanied in our quest for knowing? Uh, for Husserl, for example, in a marvelous text, he talks about how faith has to go in advance, not religious faith, 
but we have to postulate the conditions for going from A to B. And then we have to postulate those. We don't know we're going to get there. Hmm? But that itself has to be an act of humility. We have to believe and not claim to know that we're going to get there. Oh, I think that's, I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I don't, I'm, we're already past our time. But if you indulge me just for a second, I, I really appreciate so much what you've said there. But I, I couldn't understand how you could say what you said at the end with exactly the same confidence with which you referenced Im the image of, image of God. And, and I took that to be the, 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 uh, the corollary that we are made in that image and likeness. And I don't understand how one can have confidence in that assertion in the same way uh, as it were axiomatically that one can have the sense that when you get to our age, mm -hmm. understand that humility uh, humility has to precede all important human endeavor. Otherwise, we'll just continue to kill each other and, and uh, excuse it on the basis of some pre-existing belief system. Um, so anyway, thank, thank you. You're absolutely right. I, I don't have the same kind of capacity to affirm that we are made in the image of God as I have is to affirm Husserl's dictum that a, a theory that which makes theory impossible is a bad theory. That, 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 there's a different thing going on, and that's called faith. And faith isn't the same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so we we are totally out of time. Um, oh, a, a footnote. Um, <laughs> you know, time is the image of eternity. Is the next thing Aristotle says right there. And there's just so much of this kind of thing. Um, Plato says and, and, that. Plato says that. Yeah, right. And then, right, because, well, so Aristotle says it right after that, um, there's the number of uh, motion, that, that's what it is. But then you can figure out that the number of motion is kind of like the image of eternity. Before and after, yep. Okay. Right. So anyway, I mean, the, the, there's a lot there. And in like, I, Gordon, we talked about Buddhism at some point, you know, um, and the, uh, the way forms or appearances or um, images, um, you know, or, or forms, um, up here are interdependent and um, the, the wheel of samsara, the, the, the Veltmaya, as uh, Conrad Martius calls it, you know, is, um, is also shunyata or the, you know, the void. Samsara is nirvana. So, I mean, there's an interdependence we have with the environmental crisis and a responsibility to, you know, <laughs> to conduct ourselves right as well from another perspective. Another spiritual perspective. No, no question about that. All right, so we're going to move on into chapter six and and take it from there. Okay, great. Buddy. Okay. Yeah. You say Thanks, so. everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs>